and welcome to vlog number 18. Today we're going to be looking at the stages that I go through to get the TSR2 and SR71 Blackbird from concept to production. Every project starts with gathering research material and in particular tracking down a good set of plans. I'm always buying books and building up my library. Some books like this excellent volume are out of print and hard to get, so I buy them whenever I can. This book has plans for lots of post-war experimental aircraft, and of course it has a good set for the TSR2. This book from the Aeroplane Icon series documents the development history very well and has lots of excellent period photos. It also has a nice set of detailed plans, which is very useful. There are even some colour photos from back in the day, as well as the fate of the remaining airframes. My final book speculates how the TSR-2 would have appeared in service, and how it would have evolved over the years. It's well written and rationally thought out, with some very interesting ideas for camouflage schemes. There are a lot of books on the SR-71, and these are just a few. The Haynes Manual is always worth a look, with lots of great colour photos and diagrams. It explains the aircraft well, but has no plans or profiles, which is a shame. Osprey always produce excellent books, packed full of history and first-hand accounts, but they're best known for the excellent colour profiles they feature. They have two volumes on the SR-71, one featuring operations in Europe and the Middle East, the other operations in the Far East. These books are always well researched and provide a good starting point when it comes to choosing a specific aircraft to recreate. For technical information, the Warbird Tech series is excellent, telling you how the aircraft is created and operates. My last book is the Squadron Signal Blackbird Walkaround. These walkaround books are an excellent reference for any modeler, with plenty of close-up photos. Once I've found some credible plans, they're scanned and resized, based on the known wingspan and length of the aircraft. Printing out the plans gives me my first idea of the physical size of the model. It also allows me to work out just how I'm going to break down the model for sculpting and production. By this time I've usually worked out exactly which aircraft I'm going to recreate. This was an easy choice for the TSR2, but a little more involved with the SR71. I can then design the decals and get them printed. My next task is to design the model in my CAD software. This normally takes a few days, with most of the time being spent checking and cross-referencing drawings against photos. When the 3D model is complete, I can use it to create rendered images, which also help me judge whether I've got the look of the model correct. Working with the 3D model really helps me to get to know the subject and break down the parts, trying different options before I commit to 3D printing. With the parts designed, I import them into my slicer software to check and prepare them for my FDM 3D printer. The pale blue areas are the support structures, which will be broken away after printing. And here are the parts from the printer, ready for cleaning up. Some of these parts will need to be beefed up, so they'll cast, but mostly it's a case of filling and filing, just to smooth them out. To cast the exhaust for the TSR2 and the cells for the SR71, I'm getting some tapers turned up on a lathe. These will be inserted into the mould and the metal will be cast around them. They'll then be removed from the casting, leaving a hollow core. The material I'm using is called Peak, which is a high temperature plastic and will easily cope with my molten pewter at 290 degrees C. To recreate the undercarriage, I'm 3D printing the parts on my resin printer, which prints at a much higher level of detail than my FDM printer. They're also checked for errors in the slicer software, and if necessary, they're modified before being sent to the printer. Once these parts have been cleaned up and tweaked to make them cast, they're sent off to the bronze casters. It normally takes a few weeks for the moulds to be made and the parts cast and delivered, so it's important to get these sent off early. In the meantime, my tapers have been made. I've cut them down to the size I need and polished them smooth so they're easily removed from the castings. The 3D prints are now cleaned up and bulked up with milliput where necessary. 
you can see where the tapers fit in the parts. I've also added some milliput to the TSR2 intakes and undercarriage doors. A lot more milliput was added to the SR71 parts. At this point, I just want to reliably cast the parts in pewter. They'll be refined later. Right on cue, the bronze undercarriage arrived. They come in with the feed still attached. These have to be cut off with a hacksaw and then cleaned up. And here's what they look like afterwards. They'll be more than strong enough to support the aircraft and I have all the detail I could hope for. To convert the 3D printed masters into metal, I use my faithful technique of cold cure silicon moulds. These are made over a few days, first pouring one side, then the other. You can find out more about this and the following processes in my how-to series. And these are the finished moulds, cut and ready for casting. The castings themselves are very good, but need a lot of cleaning up. They'll ultimately become metal masters after a lot of cutting, filing and filling. This is an early stage with just a quick first pass on the parts to tidy them up, removing any feeds or air vents. There's still a long way to go from here. I begin by making the parts fit together and then move on to scribing in the detail. And these are the finished masters cleaned up, with all the detail added. Spare castings of the TSR2 main wing were cut down to make the horizontal and vertical tails on both aircraft. Small blisters, intakes and other details are added in milliput. The quality of the masters is reflected in the moulds and then of course in the subsequent castings. This is why I spend so long on this stage of the process. With the masters completed, I then make the vulcanised rubber moulds. These are made at 3000 psi and 150 degrees C, which is why I translate the 3D printed plastic parts into metal masters. The layout and design of the mould is based on experience and trying to predict how the metal will flow into the mould and how the air will escape. The metal feeds and air vents are cut into the mould while it's still hot. I've used plenty of locators which helps keep the two halves of the mould registered. You can see the tapered core plugs are in place which will form the TSR2 exhausts and the SR71 nacelles. Let's see how the moulds cast. After a few tweaks they cast very well once I found out the speed and temperature that they like to run at. The tapered core plugs come out of the castings easily and everything seems to have cast well. The pitots for both aircraft are lengths of fine piano wire laid in the mould and then cast in place. Now that I've got some castings, it's time to assemble the parts. This is where I discovered the best methods of cleaning up and fitting the parts together. This is a bit trial and error as I often discover better techniques on the production batches of aircraft. This often means that the production models are of a higher standard than the samples. I use a little milliput to fill any minor joins and wire wool the surface to get the best finish possible. The undercarriage is securely fixed in place and being bronze it'll allow shipping worldwide without any damage to the aircraft. But let's see what they look like finished and mounted on their base. I'm really happy with the finish on the TSR2, the detail shows up well and the decals bring it to life. I'm glad I went the extra mile and added the walkway and aileron markings. The walkway lines are very narrow on the actual aircraft, but are well reproduced here. Most importantly, the concept design for the parts worked perfectly and this will allow me to use the same techniques on larger jets. I've found testing a concept on a small scale first minimises the risk on future projects. It's all about baby steps. That's exactly how technology was developed for these awesome machines. The SR-71 is a piece of sculpture in its own right and looks menacing from any angle. The decals look great and the pattern is very authentic compared to photos of the real blackbirds. 
Just like the original, the nose wheel is white and the main undercarriage tyres are coloured aluminium with red hubs. It's hard to believe this aircraft was designed in the early 1960s. It looks cutting edge even today. You can find out more about the TSR2 and SR71 by following the links in the description, which will take you to my website. There you'll find a full history on both aircraft, and of course see many more of the aircraft I produce. As you can see from my channel, I always have lots of projects going on, which I hope you'll find interesting. You can even explore in more depth the techniques I use in my popular how-to series. I hope you enjoyed my vlog. If you did, hit the like button and make sure you subscribe to my channel. So you catch my next video when it goes live, click on the bell icon. If you have any questions, just leave them in the comments and I'll get back to you. Thanks for watching.